it's important to remember that all of these changes taking place between 1953 and 1956 came against the backdrop of a, of a struggle between the members of the collective leadership which replaced Stalin. Each of them quite fancied the top job for their own. And this struggle is to a large extent decided by uh, Khrushchev in February 1956 when he's the one who takes uh, de-Stalinization out into the public realm and gives what becomes known as the secret speech at the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Effectively, what Khrushchev did with the secret speech was to blame all of the abuses of the Stalin years on Stalin personally. There was no examination of systemic problems within the Soviet Union, of the reasons why Stalin was able to supposedly pervert the course of, of Soviet development, to drag the system into a very um, sinister mode, shall we say. Um, and so this is such a simplistic take on the Soviet Union that um, it's to a large extent functional rather than a serious and rigorous examination of the problems of Stalinism. Basically, Khrushchev said the system was not wrong. The system was fundamentally sound and he would put the system back on its proper Leninist course of development. Various aspects of Stalinist rule came under fire from Khrushchev. He criticised the lack of internal party democracy under Stalin. He insisted that under Lenin there had been thriving debate and political life within the Communist Party. Not entirely true, but not entirely false either. Um, and Khrushchev insisted he would return these principles. Stalin had stifled them and they would be back. He also insisted that um, Stalin's war leadership had not been anywhere near as effective or as, um, or as skilled as propaganda had people believe. That actually Stalin, through ignorance and through um, a refusal to accept advice, had cost many, many lives and done great damage to the Soviet defence. Perhaps most importantly, Khrushchev attacked the uh, groundless repression of communists during the period. He insisted that many, many members of the Communist Party had been groundlessly repressed during the Stalin years, that this was an unforgivable crime and had done grave damage to the party and the Soviet system. Nonetheless, these are fairly shocking revelations, but it's worth pointing out that there are many, many other uh, instances which we might call excesses of the Stalin years, which Khrushchev chose not to address. For example, Khrushchev didn't say anything about collectivization, in which massive suffering had taken place right across the Soviet Union. To him, this process had been fundamentally okay. Khrushchev also didn't say anything about repression of non-communists. Khrushchev was interested in the suffering of the Communist Party, not in the suffering of the country as a whole. At least in his secret speech, this was the case. And there was also to be no reassessment of uh, enemies labeled during the Stalin era, such as Trotsky and Bukharin, these people were still considered enemies of the Soviet state. So, again, this is a very partial examination of the Stalin problem. The secret speech doesn't become openly acknowledged until the 1980s under Glasnost and Gorbachev. Um, but news of this speech soon appeared in the West. It was read out at meetings of Communist Party members as well in the Soviet Union and also meetings of Komsomol members and certain trade union groups. The immediate reaction to the secret speech around the country was perhaps not as volatile as many people would expect. The exception to this though was in Georgia, Stalin's native land and also the native land of Lavrenti Beria, somebody else who was attacked by Khrushchev in the secret speech. In Georgia when news of Khrushchev's attack reached the Republic, protests very quickly broke out, these turned into riots and they were only put down once the Soviet army went in, um, tanks were sent in, troops were sent in, and dozens of people were killed in the ensuing violence. Among the rest of the country, though, the response tended to be stunned rather than explosive. Um, whether this was because people genuinely had no idea of things that had happened under Stalin, or because people knew what had happened, but they were amazed that the Soviet leadership had so openly begun to discuss these issues. There were certainly a great many within the Communist Party, though, who were deeply resentful of Khrushchev's attack on Stalin. Plenty of people spoke up in defence of Stalin at the meetings held to discuss the secret speech. Lots of people insisted that Khrushchev was lying, that he was slandering Stalin in order to build his own reputation as the leader of the Soviet Union, um, and essentially refused to accept that, even if these failings were true, that they outweighed Stalin's strengths and the things that Stalin had done for the Soviet system. Essentially, his achievements were more significant than his drawbacks, even if what Khrushchev said were true. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that there were many people at all levels of the party 
whose careers had been built during the Stalin years. And these people, in many cases, had progressed upwards through the system, essentially over the bodies of dead comrades. So there were many people who were to some extent complicit in repression of the Stalin years and had no real interest in, in, in a real thorough re-examining of, of what had gone on during that time. And it's also true that many people looked back on the Stalin years as something of a golden time for the Soviet Union, when the country had come of age, had become a major power on the world, had defeated Nazi Germany, and they were loath to see this, this glorious period in Soviet history you know, sullied by Khrushchev's remarks about Stalin. Conversely, and perhaps almost as widely, there were plenty of people who had desires for further liberalisation and reform in the Soviet Union, and so these voices also came to the fore at the same meetings where people tried to defend Stalin. Lots of people called for faster and deeper liberalisation of the Soviet system. These were primarily people from among the intelligentsia. This would be the overwhelmingly urban, educated population, often people with professional careers and so on, students and such like and also reform-minded members of the Communist Party and Komsomol. The problem for these people was that seemingly Khrushchev was on their side in the way that he attacked Stalin, but they took their criticism beyond the bounds of what Khrushchev had in mind, in the sense that Khrushchev, as I said earlier, only blamed everything on Stalin. The liberal voices tend to look for deeper roots within the system. They tended to talk about the need to make sure this kind of thing could not ever happen again. Um, they questioned, in many cases, where were the other members of the leadership during the Stalin years? What were they doing? They must have known what was happening and they did nothing. These people should be charged. The problem with that was, those people who did nothing were also the people who were now the leadership of the Soviet Union. So these were some very kind of penetrating and sensitive questions that people started to ask. It's worth remembering though in this context that most of those people who spoke out with liberalism and demands for greater um, reform were not anti-communist for the most part. These were people who wanted to help fix the flaws in the system, not people who wanted any kind of restoration of capitalism or an end of the communist system. The secret speech actually, for many people, particularly young educated liberals, re released hopes of um, optimism and a real sense of idealism that actually now the Soviet Union could be put back on the right track and things would progress much better in the future. There was also an important element of confusion at this stage, not least because in, in delivering the secret speech in, as the name suggests, a, a fairly secretive manner, the authorities weren't able to properly prescribe what it told about uh, the events of the Stalin years, and so people didn't really know where the new boundaries were in terms of what could and could not be said. So lots of people relatively innocently made comments which were described as uh, unacceptable by the regime. Over the course of 1956, the authorities began to reel in some of these um, ambiguities in regard to what could and could not be said about Stalin. Newspaper articles were published, um, people would be expelled from the party, from the Komsomol, people would lose jobs and university places, but they generally weren't thrown in jail at this stage. Again, this is a significant indicator of the extent to which times had changed already since the Stalin era. This sense of liberalism and optimism for the future was largely brought to a crashing halt at the end of 1956 with the Hungarian Revolution. This was in itself, to a large extent, a product of Khrushchev's promises of, of reform and liberalisation. When those promises were not to be met in Hungary, um, liberals became increasingly agitated. They um, eventually managed to succeed in taking hold of power. And the, so and the system in Hungary quickly descended into um, very, very intense reform, which was far too fast for the Soviet Union to tolerate. And ultimately, troops were sent in and the Hungarian Revolution, as it's known, was put down with massive amounts of bloodshed. And this, for those people at home who desired liberalisation, was a clear indicator that things hadn't changed anywhere near as much as they seemed to think at the time of the secret speech. So what followed was a certain sense of, of bitterness and frustration that already the promises of reform seemed to be um, going back upon. What followed from this was um, a brief spell of intensified political repression. The number of arrests of people engaging in political activity rose again, although it's important to point out that we're talking about arrests approaching 2,000 people in the course of 1957. 
This is an absolute drop in the ocean compared to even the most peaceful years of Stalinist repression. Nonetheless, the process of, of liberalisation was largely reeled in. This is actually the way that de-Stalinisation would continue throughout the Khrushchev period. Spells of reform would be quickly followed by spells of retrenchment. There was to be no consistent advancement in terms of um, deep liberalisation. This was partly because liberals within the political system and conservatives within the political system were consistently fighting each other to, to gain supremacy, to gain control of the direction that the regime took. And it was also because Khrushchev himself was um, a very unpredictable and inconsistent leader. He tended to veer from one position to the next, especially on the Stalin question. He was um, the leading voice, he was the only man who could really drive Stalin de-Stalinisation along, but he did not always choose to do so consistently. He was also very concerned, particularly after wit witnessing the events in Hungary, that events in the Soviet Union could not be allowed to spill out of control as they had in Hungary there would be no one able to prop up the Soviet regime if it too fell into the kind of trouble that the Hungarian regime had fallen into. It's worth pointing out though in this context that there's no mass desire for the revolution, for revolution rather, in the Soviet Union at this stage, although there are nonetheless a great many deep, deep problems and frustrations within society which Khrushchev has to be careful not to stir up too much. There are problems in terms of um, nationalities in places like Ukraine, the Baltic states, uh, now in Georgia in particular. Um, there are also repressed religious groups. There are millions of people who have been through the Gulag. Um, and so there are lots of tensions within Soviet society that the regime has to be very careful not to, to bring to the surface, if at all possible. 